Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. And welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving yesterday, however you may have celebrated. Ours was lovely. We spent it with some friends, and it was quiet, but really, really nice. Um, I ate carbs a lot, a lot, a lot of carbs, (laughs) which I haven't been doing much of lately, so... Ah, yeah, that was a really nice day of feasting. Um, But not only feasting and carbs, but spending time with friends and Skyping with my family and speaking over the phone with my in-laws. It was just a great day full of friends and family and um, feasting and fellowship if you want to go with great alliteration there. I hope that however you spent yours and whomever you spent it with, that whether it was biological family or family of your own choosing or however that worked out, that it was also a day full of um, love and laughter and feasting if that's that's what you like to do if you had to work yesterday thank you so much for doing that i hope that there's still some time to spend with family and friends we are here with another interview we have we had two this week as i mentioned on tuesday's episode and also as i mentioned i am speaking today with susan k hamilton about her new book shadow king which is a dark fantasy tale and i have to admit that a while back, I don't even know when, I didn't really realize that there were different subgenres of fantasy. I mean, I guess I, I guess I realized that there was a difference between types of fantasy, but I'd never thought about the fact that they would have different names. So for instance, high fantasy where you have, you know, entire worlds that are being built and let's say Lord of the Rings would be high fantasy as opposed to urban fantasy, which it tends to take place alongside our regular current modern world type of thing. Well, now I find out that there's also dark fantasy and I guess I hadn't really thought about that either. Apparently I just read and don't think too much about the genre. So I love learning new things. And I learned with this interview, speaking with Susan and reading her book, that there is such a thing as dark fantasy. And she talks more about that in the interview. I'll let her do that. I instead am going to give you the description from the back of the book. And that says, centuries ago, the fairy realm was decimated by a vile and corrupt spell. To survive, the different fairy races, led by the Fae, escaped to the human realm, where they've lived ever since. As the Fae patriarch of Boston's criminal underworld, Aidan Collins enjoys his playboy lifestyle while he works from the shadows to expand his growing empire, until one night when he shares a shot of whiskey with the lovely Saradin Moore. A Fae seer, Saradin is haunted by a vision of the Fae responsible for destroying fairy and murdering her family. Common sense tells her to stay away from Aedin, but his mag- his magnetism and charm are irresistible. As their passionate affair intensifies, Saradin is pulled into the center of the underworld. And while her b- heart is bound to Aedin, she cannot let go of her lifelong quest to hunt down the fae who haunts her visions. Especially when she realizes Aedin might be the key to helping her find him. But is revenge worth betraying the one she loves? So you've got a lot going on just from that description, right? You can say, you can tell that it is not only dark fantasy, but it is also urban fantasy taking place in Boston. What I found different about this book, though, was that the fairy world is basically completely integrated with our own world. Often in urban fantasy, there's kind of a separation where some people know it's there, some people know it exists and can see it, while the majority of humans cannot, and they... They sometimes stumble into it or end up being able to see it for some reason or another. In this case, 
everyone knows it's there. Fairies and humans live alongside each other. They have had to figure out how to do that, how to integrate, etc. I thought that was a really interesting take on uh, kind of a typical urban fantasy. So you've got dark fantasy, you've got urban fantasy, there is obviously romance, there's a bit of mystery with Saradin trying to figure out who this uh, fae is that she keeps seeing in her visions. And you've got some great complex characters because Aiden is the head of um, a crime syndicate, if you will. He's the patriarch of Boston. He does things that I don't necessarily always approve of that make me go, oh, yeah, I really don't like you right now. <laughs> but he's not just that one thing. And there are other things that I appreciated about him. They didn't make me want to ignore the stuff that I didn't like, but they at least reminded me that this was a very complicated individual. And Saradin as well has different layers as she interacts with Aiden and tries to figure out how she's going to navigate this relationship with the the quest that she's had for herself for her whole life of figuring out who was responsible and who is the the person that she keeps seeing in those visions. So if you like urban fantasy, this is definitely something that you'll want to check out. If you want to, if you've never read dark fantasy or urban fantasy, then give this one a shot, you know, go ahead. Uh, like I said, it's got lots of different elements with mystery and um, crime and romance, all those good things. So Enough out of me. Let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Susan K. Hamilton about her book, The Shadow King. Hi, Susan. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here today. I am happy to have you here. We are here to talk about your newest book, which is called Shadow King. Before we do that, though, I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit. Could you share a little about, about yourself? Sure. I... Um... I live in the Boston, Massachusetts area. I have lived here my entire life. In fact, my family is pretty much the first boat after the Mayflower kind of descendants. Wow. Uh, so we've been here a long time. Um, I went to school in-state at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Um, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, actually, as a communication specialist. So communication and writing is both my hobby and my profession. And uh, I am married to my husband, Jeff, and we live about 30 miles outside the city with our cat, Rio, who is actually recovering right now from hip surgery. Oh, well, I hope Rio is okay. She's doing much better. In fact, she's sound asleep on her fleecy blanket in front of a heater right now. Oh, so she's perfect. very, very happy. <laughs> Does she have to have a cone of shame? No, she's... Uh, passed the window for the cone of shame, but she actually didn't need one. She was super good about not being nudgy about her incision. Oh, so. good for her. Uh, Which um, was really good. Yeah. I, just, I hate putting them in the hose. <laughs> <laughs> no, no they, do, they look so miserable. Um, yeah. So we're not here to talk about your cat, although I could. Um, tell <laughs> us a bit about Shadow King. Uh, Shadow King is a dark urban fantasy. Um, I started writing it probably around 2016 or so um, and did the usual, uh, wrote it, went through a bunch of my own internal edits, had a couple friends uh, beta read it for me, and then I decided to take a chance and enter it in the Launchpad Manuscript Competition. And the reason I entered the contest was because one of the things you could get was feedback from the judges. And sometimes as a writer, it is so hard to get feedback from the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you submit um, just to a slush pile at a publisher, and I understand they get thousands and thousands of unsolicited manuscripts, so they can't tell everybody you know, what's good and bad about their individual submission. Um, but at the same time, sometimes you wonder, you know, do they not like it because they don't like the plot development or do they not like it because they broke up with their significant other last night and, and nobody's making the right. cut today. Right. Um, cause it's like, so what, if I don't know what to change, how do I get better? Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to get feedback, I was like, all right, if nothing else, I will come away with that. And even if they don't like it, at least it gives me something to think about for, from a revision standpoint. Mm hmm. To my delight, 
I got a first notification saying I'd made their top 75 list, and then I made the top 50, and I made it all the way to their top 10 finalists. Wow. Which was thrilling. Yeah. And very un- and very unexpected. Um, and although I did not win the overall competition, that was how I hooked up with uh, Inkshares, my publisher. And by the time the competition was done, they they do a a crowdfunded publishing model. So by the time I was done with the competition, although I didn't win, I had garnered enough support um, from readers to qualify for publishing through Inkshares. So had it not been for that competition, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be here today having this conversation probably. Interesting. That's really fascinating. Um, so this is a, a dark urban fantasy, as you said. What was your yep. inspiration for the story? The inspiration, it's... Um, maybe a little more unusual than people might think is I was trying to come up with an idea for National Novel Writing Month or NaNoWriMo, which I, um, you, the people listening are probably familiar, but if not, it's a competition where you, you're challenged to write a 50,000 word rough draft in 30 days. Mm-hmm. It's going on right now. And I was, it, it is. In fact, I was going to do it this year, but the, um, the cat surgery kind of mm. put the kibosh on that, yeah. <laughs> but there's always next year. Um, but I was trying to think of an idea for that particular nano competition, and I just wasn't coming up with anything. And it was literally about 24 hours before the start of the competition, and I was outside raking leaves. And sometimes doing something just physical where you don't have to put a lot of intellectual thought into it is the best solution when you're blocked on a problem. And as I was working, I was just thinking about different things I liked and, you know, what could I write about? And I started thinking about, I've always had a soft spot for Irish folklore. So I said, well, what, you know, is there anything I could do with that? And I said, well, you know, if, if all of these fairies we know from Irish folklore, like lived in this world, what would they do? And I said, well, you know the 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 light fairies would be the models and the actresses because you you always see them portrayed as you know tall and beautiful and and elegant. I said so they'd definitely be the the showbiz end of it. So, but what would the the dark fairies do? And I said I said well they they'd probably be the criminals. And all of a sudden I went they'd probably run Boston's criminal underworld. And I literally put down my bag, I put down my rake, I went back in the house, and I wrote, like, hand-wrote probably a page of notes just about that concept. Because as soon as I thought of it, I was like, I, there's something there I don't know what yet. But it was the first idea I got excited about. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then I went back out and finished the yard work so I didn't completely desert my husband <laughs> uh, and leave him to finish it. Right. Um. And then I went back in, and the next day I started Nano, and out of that came the first draft of Shadow King. So I didn't go into it planning to write a dark fantasy or really anything. It came up with the idea, and then I came up with um, Aiden Collins, who's my lead male character, and it it all came out of that. Mm -hmm. And so talk a little bit about Aiden and Saradin, the main characters. What do you think... um about them will resonate with readers? Well, I, I hope in Aiden's case um, that people will see, although he runs the criminal underworld, which means he, he does some illegal things, he's not necessarily a nice person. Mm-hmm. But I hope what people will see is that within the confines of his world and his society that he's He's very loyal. He's got a a very strong sense of right and wrong, even if he may apply it in our world in a way we don't necessarily approve of. I like to compare the the concept to what people saw in in things like either The Sopranos or um, Sons of Anarchy, in the sense that he he's more of an antihero. But if you if you look at those TV series. The again, the the people in them are not necessarily nice people. They're they're criminals, 
but when you look at their relationships with each other, there is this very profound sense of of loyalty and love and steadfastness and, you know, I've got your back no matter what because, you know, you're in it with me. And I want hopefully that to come out because I think those qualities still make him a relatable character. He's definitely got his flaws and he's definitely got his issues, which, again, hopefully makes him relatable as well to people. For for Saradin, I think she's a little different. I actually, my very first drafts really focused mostly on Aiden, and she was a more minor character. And then as my drafts developed, I got a lot of very interesting feedback, including during the launch pad competition, that people were more interested in her point of view uh, because she was also an outsider, so they were able to relate to how she was viewing her relationship with Aiden and his world. So from that feedback, she became a much larger character, and and I'm, I was really appreciative of the feedback because I think beefing up her role in it made it a much better and more compelling story. I think people will connect with her because I I hope I've made her she she's independent and stubborn. Uh, she's a, she's a little bit rash. She doesn't always make the best decisions. Um, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. I know I can. Mm-hmm. Occasionally have made a decision and gone, that was probably not the smartest thing you've ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and hopefully they see that her in her as well as she's also got her own fears and her own insecurities and things that drive her to make some of those decisions from a place of insecurity as opposed to confidence. And having that little bit bit of hesitation in her, again, I think makes her more real to people. At least I hope it does. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our first break of the podcast. I do want to say that before we went into the interview, I called the book The Shadow King. It's just Shadow King, no definitive article, so I apologize for that. Um, you've gotten uh, to know Aiden and Saradin a little bit from Susan's perspective, so we are going to take that break, and when we come back, we'll be talking more about characters and writing and her other books. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Hi, this is Sarah, host of the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As not only the host of a book review podcast, but also someone who loves to read, I get excited when I get to recommend books for you, and I have one of those today. The New York Times bestselling author of Hoot, Carl Hyacin, is back with Squirm, a wildly entertaining, slightly twisted new adventure about snakes, grizzly bears, a spy drone, a missing dad, and knowing when and when not to let things go. Squirm is recommended for readers ages 8 through 12, so if you have someone in your life who might enjoy this book or someone in your life who you already know loves Carl Hyacin, maybe you love to read together as a family. Whether you're already fans or you're looking for something new to read, I can definitely recommend Squirm by Carl Hyacin. Support for this message comes from Random House Children's Books, and Squirm is available now wherever books are sold. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Susan was talking about her two main characters, Aiden and Saradin, and the layers and levels of complexity that exist within those characters. So with that refresher, let's go ahead and get back to the interview. I really, um, I, I didn't read early drafts, obviously, but I definitely appreciated the fact that both voices were present, so that you had Aiden's voice and Saradin's voice, and you were getting the story from at least two different viewpoints. Um, and Wonderful. in terms of Aiden, he's such a fascinating character because when the book started, there's a scene, I'm not going to give anything away, but there was a scene and I was like, oh my gosh, I kind of hate this guy. <laughs> and then, so there's, there's, there's his professional um, persona and then there's the way he interacts with Saradin that's respectful and, um, you know, it's sometimes you get some issues with consent in novels like this and he's, there's none of that. So there's just some really, he's, 
he's very multifaceted and um i was glad that we moved beyond my initial i kind of hate this guy <laughs> reaction good i'm glad because i'm i'm hoping that people will will hate some of the things he does yeah but become invested enough in him to say i didn't like that he did that but i i i can understand why yeah so um oh, and been backtracking a little bit, but thank you for putting a pronunciation guide in the back. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I, I got I got that feedback. the The first book I had ever put out, I did not do something like that, and I had a number of people say it would would have been helpful. So I always remembered that, and I was like, the next one, I will absolutely make sure I remember a character list. Mm-hmm. I love fantasy, but sometimes I'm like, I have absolutely no idea how to pronounce this word. <laughs> So thank you for that. Um, I know it's fantasy, but are there autobiographical elements in the story or the characters, uh, besides the setting, obviously, Boston? Um, in this particular case, I would say no. Um, in, in my own imagination, I, I wish I was a, as kick-ass as Saradin is in some of it, but I'm I'm not. <laughs> um, but I would say not terribly in this case. Although I did have someone tell me I I tend to be a come as you are, not wear makeup, um, blue jeans and sweatshirt kind of girl. And um, one person pointed out that there is one scene where Sheridan makes a point where she's just is kind of just beyond. She's just over the idea of like having to dress up. And then someone said, that sounds a little like you. And I was like, all right, maybe that one little scene, yes. Right. But that is, that's probably about as autobiographical as it gets. Okay. Uh, and then you said you were inspired by Irish folklore. What kind of research did you do for the story? Um, I actually didn't do a lot of formal research. Um, I have, having just read some folklore over the years that, the idea of the the seely and the unseely courts is i don't know like kind of ingrained in in me a little bit um so i did not base this on any one particular fairy tale or legend um i did do some research to try and find types of fairies from other cultures because throughout the book uh they interact with some some persian fairies some norse fairies and i wanted to make sure that i had at least authentic names and descriptions of what these creatures at least looked like. Um, so I did do some research in that respect. A lot of the the Boston research is just from walking around. One of the, the jobs I had in the city, I used to be able to walk to where the federal courthouse is um, and the seaport area, which has become very developed and is a very now up-and-coming part of the city. And there were these beautiful condominiums being built. And I used to be able to go from my office, make a loop around where the condos were being built, and then get back within the confines of my lunch break. So I watched these go up. And every time I I walked around it, when you looked back, it has this beautiful view across Boston Harbor to the Financial District, which, in my opinion, is one of the prettiest views of the city that you can get. And as I was starting to write the book, I was said one day I was like, "This is exactly where Aiden would live." I'm like, he would pay big bucks to have the penthouse in this building and have that view. And from there, I started kind of looking at the area around it, you know, where the restaurants were, where a few other things were, and started pulling them in as scenes and uh, settings for different scenes in the book. Now. Often with urban fantasy, you have the human world existing alongside the 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 other world, whatever kind of world it is. In this case, we have fairies. Um, and some people know about it, but most people don't. In this case, everyone knows that the fairies have yep. integrated. So can you talk a little bit about that decision? Yeah, sure. I, um, I didn't want... I didn't want the fairies in this book to have an an easy out in the sense that if something went wrong, I didn't want them to be able to just jump back to the world of fairy and have no consequences. So I tried to think of, like, what would prevent them from doing that, and I was like, well, 
basically their version of nuclear winter in their world, which would force them to live in the human world whether they liked it or not, and how that would affect them as a a race of of creatures in general, how it might mess with their ability to use magic. Because I also didn't want them to be these super powerful magical beings that, again, if they got into trouble, could just cast a spell or manipulate people to get whatever they wanted. I wanted them to have to interact with humans and kind of carve out their own place in our world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. This is your second book. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about the first one, Dark Star Rising? Sure. I actually, Dark Star um, started way, way, way back in the day when I was in college. I had an English professor my freshman year at UMass Amherst, and the final assignment she gave us for the freshman writing class was to do something creative. And of course, that was the assignment, something creative? Yes, that was the extent of it. Something creative. Oh my god! And pretty much, and pretty much the whole class looked at her like, no essay about the economic recovery of Europe after World War II. Right. What is this? What is this creative thing you're talking about? Yeah. And she said, she said just something creative. She said, the start of a screenplay, a short story, a couple chapters of a novel. She said, a collection of poetry, and then. I remember she clarified, she said, and if you're doing poetry, she goes, it better be more than one haiku. <laughs> so at the time, I was, I was really into, I've always loved comic books, but in college I was really into reading a, a whole bunch of different ones. And I had just finished one particular series because it, it had ended. And I asked her if I could write like my own next chapter, mm. you know, what, what I would like to see happen to the characters. I, su- I suppose it was I suppose it was fan fiction before I ever knew what the concept of fan fiction was. Um, but for me, it was like I could you know turn this into something. And she said that that was fine. She said just to give her an acknowledgement page, you know, to clarify that not every character was my original idea. But she said, from a plagiarism point of view, give me that and we're covered. And I said okay. And I went back to her a couple days later and said, this is going to be a little bit longer than the the 12 pages you were looking for. Is that okay? And I asked that mainly because my, my grandparents were teachers. And I remember being a little kid when they would babysit me. And we would sit there and they would have Lawrence Welk on. And they would be correcting papers until 9 o'clock at night. So meanwhile, this poor grad student probably has two or three freshman English classes all giving her, with 20 kids, giving her 14-page papers. Right. If she had said, really, I'm not going to have time to correct anything longer than that or grade something longer than that, I would have been like, okay, I get it. And I would have limited it. But she said, no, write till you're done. I said, okay. And I kept writing. And I went back and I said, it's going to be a lot longer than 12 pages. And she said, the only limit I'm going to put on you is you have to turn it in by the deadline. She said, whether you're done with it or not. And I said, all right. And I ended up giving her a 75-page story. Whoa. <laughs> I got an A in the class. <laughs> wow. And I had so much fun with it that I said, what, what's stopping me from writing a book? I mean, I just kind of knocked... Not that it was nothing, but I enjoyed it so much it felt like no effort. I said, so what's stopping me? So I said, let's give it a shot. And I started bringing a notebook to classes, and I I came up with some ideas and a character, and I didn't even really know what I was doing at the time. Um, And started to cobble together a little bit of a plot, and Dark Star is more of a traditional epic fantasy. Uh, It's not a dark fantasy. And would write between classes and then transfer it to the computer after my homework was done. And it probably took me about a year to to cobble together my first rough draft, which was about 250 pages long. Mm -hmm. And I put it away for like two weeks and then I read it and I hated it. 
hated everything about it. Oh, no. I hadn't really picked my audience. So half of it was written for like a, a late high school to adult age group. And the other half was written more for like a preteen, early young adult. And they just didn't mix well. Um, so I ripped it up and started over. And there's nothing like throwing away 250 pages worth of work to yeah. make you go, oh, God, what have I done? Yeah, wow. <laughs> but I'm glad I did. I started. I kept one character and started over from scratch. And that ended up becoming Dark Star Rising. Once the draft was finished, I did my own editing and proofreading. I had a, a friend who was a proofreader proofread it for me as well. And then I started shopping it around. I didn't have an agent. Um, and it was, and I'm dating myself a little bit here, but it was it was back before there was such a thing as online submissions. So you had to go through the whole process of you know, printing out your synopsis and printing out three to five chapters, depending on what the requirements were, packing them up with the self-addressed stamped envelope, sending it off to a publisher, and then waiting until they most likely told you no. And that happened a few times, and, and it was frustrating. And, and every person who has written and tried to publish understands that frustration. And I looked at self-publishing, but at the time, you had to contract with a small press. They wanted you to commit to buying like 3,000 copies of the book. And A, I couldn't afford that. And B, where on earth was I going to keep 3,000 copies of a book? Right. I, and I had said to my husband once, I said, you know, I'm certainly not going to keep them in the basement. You know, if the water heater lets go and ruins them all, it's, I said, you're going to see a part of my personality you've never seen before and probably don't like because the investment would be ruined in that mm -hmm. case. So I kept submitting and, and chugging along with that. But then I started to learn more about print-on-demand publishing as that was becoming a little more mainstream. And that was interesting because it's, it allowed you to self-publish, but because you weren't committed to, you still had to obviously you know, pay a fee for the design and, and all of that, but you weren't committed to that mass quantity of books. If you only needed five copies, you could get them. If you needed 5,000, you could get that too. But it was like, all right, this is more reasonable. And at that point, my, my husband who and I were just getting married. We were buying our first house. And I was like, it's a lot less expensive, but we could buy a really nice you know, living room or dining room set for what I would pay for this book. And I kind of feel like I need to be a responsible adult and, and like spend my money on, on grown-up things. And finally, my husband said to me, we had, a, we had a really long conversation about it, and it came down to him asking me, you know, if you didn't take this opportunity, would you regret it? And I said, quite possibly, yes. He said, well, then go do it. I said, really? And he was like, yep, absolutely, go do it. Nice. So I did. Um, and I went the uh, print-on-demand route. I probably, I've probably sold over 300 copies of it since it came out, and that was back in 2003. Um, my main source of marketing at that time, because, again, there really was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. So getting the word out mainly meant me going to the sci-fi fantasy conventions in Boston, setting up a little table, and talking to anybody who would stop by and listen to my speech. Um, and I, I'm really glad. I mean, some people have, you know, said, you know, was it, was it worth it? You didn't really make any money off it. I, but I learned so much, not only about writing and editing, but about putting yourself out there a little bit and self-marketing, which is not something that was a strength for me at the time. Um, cause it, it's scary to put yourself out there. Yeah. And then one of the most rewarding parts of it was after I had been to the Aresia convention, um, and, and any book I sent, I sold, I signed, and I, I literally put my email address in with a note saying, when you're done, I would love to hear what you thought of it. 
and I got an email from a woman who said that she she loved it, she loved the characters, and I think the the last line of it was that she she would share the story with her grandchildren, and I sat at my computer and I cried. Mm-hmm. And my poor husband was like, what's wrong? I was like, she just said the nicest thing about my book. And it was that, that first person who had who had no emotional connection to my well-being. Because mm-hmm. you know, your, your mom, even if it's terrible, will tell you it's lovely. Right. Um, and your friends always want to be supportive. So sometimes you're like, no, nah, I, I really want to know what you think, even if you don't like it. So to have this complete stranger who didn't have to tell me she liked it at all, be that enthusiastic about it was just like the best thing ever. (laughs) Yeah, that is a great story. And I think that great story is a great place to pause and take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we will be talking about Susan's new book that is coming out next year. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we're just going to jump right back into the conclusion of my interview with Susan K. Hamilton. You also have another book, uh, The Devil Inside, coming out Mm -hmm. in 2019. So uh, it's not out yet, but what can you tell us about that story? That story um, was another um, NaNoWriMo plot of mine, which I did the year after... Shadow King, and I also entered it in the Launchpad Manuscript competition the year after Shadow King did, and I ended up top 25 on that one, so I was very excited to go back to back. Yeah. The Devil Inside, uh, my main character is Mara Delahan, and she is a devil, and she is working her way to become Hell's top sales and acquisitions devil for the year. Oh, jeez. And she's got some rivals hot on her heels for that point, for for that position. Uh, and after a long day at the office, she crosses paths with Duncan DeMarco, who is a, a handsome angel stuck in a dead-end job with a boss he hates. Um, and he's exactly the kind of trouble that she she doesn't need but can't resist. And they end up embarking on an illicit love affair, knowing that if they are found out, uh, it would, will likely mean their, not only their careers, but possibly their lives, because everyone in hell knows that Lucifer will most likely rip the wings off any devil who's caught getting friendly or frisky with an angel. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. And her secret life only just gets more and more complicated as her, her drive to be, get that number one spot intensifies, especially when her rival starts to that there might be more than one way to bring his competition down, and he starts really trying to dig into what the things she's keeping secret. And she tries to cover her tracks, but of course, sniffing out dark secrets are what she and her fellow devils all do best. Um, and the question is, will she manage to keep all of her secrets hidden and Duncan safe, or will she be ruined when pretty much literally all hell breaks loose? <laughs> 
So uh, do you have a potential release date for that? Um, I am hoping it will be fall of 2019. Uh, the last update I got from the Inkshares editorial team is they were hoping to have the line editor get to it in the spring. And that could be anywhere from February to May at this point. Right. So once they get it, it should be about six months from that point to release. But I won't know a definite date until I know when the editor is going to get uh, their hands on it. Okay. And so is that, would you consider that a dark fantasy as well? Yes. Yeah, I would definitely consider it a dark fantasy. I think it's got a, a, a bigger dose of um, humor in it than Shadow King does. Because uh, Mara is definitely smart-mouthed and irreverent. As a devil should be. Um, as, yes, as hopefully a devil should be. <laughs> right. So what do you think it is about the, the, the genre of dark fantasy that inspires you or draws you to it? Believe it or not, I'm actually very new to it. I didn't... I, I don't think I even realized that dark fantasy was a sh- sub-genre of fantasy when I was writing Shadow King. I just, I I loved the idea of this kind of, these darker fairies who are traditionally dark in um, folklore and putting them in our world. And then when I got to a point where I started going, well, how would I market this thing? That's when I started to see a lot of the, like, the urban and dark fantasy material that's out. And I just went, this is all fascinating. And I started reading more of it. Um in particular, Kim um, Harrison's series um, with the Hollows is been has been wonderful. I've been working my way through that and enjoying it very much. I think what appeals to me about the dark fantasy aspects is that in the world today, I mean, it's there are some pretty dark aspects of our world, mm-hmm. um, which is unfortunate, and. The dark fantasy, I think, gives you a way to ad- address some of the, the darker parts of society and psychology from a bunch of different angles. By using fantasy creatures, it gives you a chance to examine things like like in Shadow King. There are some. I don't get into it too deeply. But there are some elements of racism in there and kind of explore those themes through a slightly different lens, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, We've got the book coming out in 2019. What's next? Are you working on something else? I uh, I have a couple ideas. I have been well. My my nano project for this year, which is temporarily on hiatus until probably next month, um, is hopefully going to be a follow up to Shadow King. Okay. Um, and then I have another idea that is really a. It'll be another dark fantasy, um, with more of a focus on witches as opposed to like fairies or other supernatural creatures. Um, And that is literally about three pages of notes and questions and character sketches and not really more form than that. But I have this, I'm my working title for it is the Cardinal witch. Um, And beyond the pile of notes, I have that same feeling about it that I had for Shadow King, that there's something there that I'm really excited about. I just haven't unpacked exactly what it is yet. Right. Oh, well, that will be fun and challenging. So do you have advice for aspiring authors? Absolutely. Um, One thing I would say is just stick with it. Uh, I, I, I think most every author would would give that advice because writing is a lo- it's a marathon it is not a sprint. It's very rare that somebody writes their first book and it shoots up the bestseller list and everybody wants them. Not impossible, but that's definitely the exception to the rule. I think one of the quotes that gets passed around a lot is 
Stephen King got rejected something like, what, 40 or 60 times before he finally landed his first publishing deal. Right, something like that. Yeah, so it's the same thing. So, so the first bit of advice would be stick to it. Even if you know you write something and it's not going well, you know, put that away for a little while, start something else, maybe go back to the other one. So in some cases, it might just not be the right time for it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not worth publishing, so don't give up on stuff. The other advice I would give is don't be afraid to try and do it slightly differently. Because like with Shadow King, you know, I once I was ready, I started querying agents and I started querying publishers and was, was pretty much on that linear track to what I hoped would be traditional publishing. And then when that the Launchpad competition came up, I said, I've got nothing to lose. The worst is I don't win it and they tell me they don't like it. Best case, I win it, and holy cow. Right. But if you, if you don't take that chance, it doesn't happen. And for me, by taking that chance, it opened a door I didn't know existed, and I got to my end goal that way. So just because the straight path isn't necessarily working, don't be afraid to look at the the paths that branch off it a little bit because you never know what might work for you right right you never know until you try if you (laughs) want to go that route right um you mentioned one of the dark fantasy authors that you have been reading what what else do you have other favorite authors or genres that you read um i try to read a lot of everything i do tend to read a lot of fantasy um I'm I'm an only child, so I think growing up I had to I had to develop an imagination or it was gonna be pretty boring childhood. So because of that I think I gravitate towards fantasy because it can be anything you want it to be. Um but I have I'm trying to think there are a lot and certainly this She's probably on everybody's list, but uh, Rowling's Harry Potter series is definitely a favorite of mine. Um, I love the way she was able to develop characters and have them be so have so many facets in them. I really liked that a lot. Um, I do like there's a, a trilogy, and I don't remember when it came out. They're out of print now by Patricia Keneally Morrison. And it was called the Keltiad. It was the Throne of Scone, the Copper Crown, and the Silver Branch. I think were the three individual titles. And she did a wonder. What I felt was wonderful blend of science fiction and Celtic lore, hmm. because in her story, the 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 Celts and the Fomori and all of those creatures from legend left Earth, went into space, and colonized planets. Oh, interesting. And now have their their own society and that balances both science and magic. And there was something about her writing, and it was that, for me, it was that intangible something, because I think everybody finds that author that they just love, and they can pick out certain things about the style or the characters but beyond that, there's just that something that they connected with. Right. Um, and her series was that for me. It's like I just, I have absolutely dog-eared copies up in my bookshelf, and I actually went out and bought duplicate copies that are all, like, wrapped in plastic to be preserved so that when my, my first versions finally disintegrate, I have backups. Right, right. Because I didn't, I didn't want to lose these three books. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's wonderful. Um, do you have a website, and where can people find you on social media? Sure, I do have a website. It is uh, susankhamilton.com. Uh, on Facebook, I have an author site as well as a personal site. I believe the address for the the author one is has uh, Hamilton Susan K in it. And then on both Twitter and Instagram, 
I am at Real S K Hamilton. Okay. And are there links on your website for the social media? Yes, there are. Perfect. Okay. So we And I'll confess oh, I'm brand um I confess I'm brand new to Instagram, so I think I've only put like two things up. Right. <laughs> Uh, I, so I know that, that feeling. That one is a work. That one's a work in progress. Okay. Well, we can get in on the ground floor and, and grow with you <laughs> when we follow you. Um, what else is there? Anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention in terms of writing, in terms of your books, in terms of just anything we haven't covered? Um, I think the only thing I would I would add, is, and I know you were you mentioned in some of your the questions you had sent ahead of time was, um, you know, how did I start writing? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we skipped that and, one. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Because it, it's actually kind of interesting. I've always loved to write. Um, and when I was a kid, I was one of those kids who was curious about a lot of things. But if I didn't necessarily get a ton of really positive feedback on something, once my own curiosity was satisfied, I was off to the next thing I was interested in. Um, and I tried writing, and my, my grandmother was a reading teacher, so I pretty much had books in my hands from as soon as I could hold books up. And I wrote a story once. I also, I've been into horses my whole life. I've ridden since I was about seven. So, of course, anything I wrote when I was about eight years old had to do with ponies because there was nothing else in my world but ponies. Um, and I wrote a story, and then probably 10 pages handwritten in that great, like, elementary school scrawl that kids have. And I showed it to my grandmother, and I was all proud of it. And I remember, I very vividly remember her being like, oh, that's nice. And she just kind of put it aside. Oh, no. And I was like, okay, guess it wasn't very good. And But again, with my nature, I was like, on to the next thing that interests me. And years later, after I had written Dark Star, um, I was talking to my grandmother about it, and she said, oh, I remember this story you wrote when you were probably seven or eight. It was about ponies, and it was wonderful. Oh, wow. And I said, you didn't say anything to me about it back then. I said, I, I never thought you liked that story. And she said, oh, no. She goes, I, I thought it was far too good for a child your age. I thought you had copied it, and I didn't want to encourage that. <gasps> oh, no. And I was like, well, thank you for the vote of confidence on my moral upbringing. <laughs> and, she, and she got all flushed. She's like, no, that's not what I meant. Oh, <laughs> I was like, hilarious. oh, man. So, like, I could have been writing all these years. Um, so that was really the genesis of my writing was way back then. But I, from about age probably nine to college, Unless it was an assignment in school, I kind of took a hiatus from it. And it was thanks to that freshman writing teacher that I got back into it and realized how much I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's, it's just amazing the, um, the, the way maybe seemingly offhand comments can really change the way you view things, you know, from the eight-year-old, yeah. the eight-year-old whose grandmother said, oh, that's nice, to then the freshman in college who really was encouraged to write until you're done. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Anything else? I don't think so, unless you have other questions. No, I think we covered, we covered a lot. I want to thank you for taking time out of your weekend to talk to me about your books. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, it was wonderful getting to know you and your books. Uh, so the book is Shadow King. It is out now. And um, I, well, I guess we didn't talk about uh, you can find it pretty much anywhere, right? Yep. It is um, online uh, on any of the online retailers, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound. Uh, you can ask for it at your local bookseller. Uh, they may or may not have it on the shelf, but they should be able to order it. And it's also available on the Inkshare site as well. Okay. And is it available in ebook as well? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's print and ebook, and I'm just starting to explore getting it turned into an audio book, but um, we haven't quite gotten that off the ground yet, but it's coming. Oh, cool. Wonderful. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you so much. 
As always, thank you so much to my guest, Susan K. Hamilton, for taking the time to come on the podcast and talk about her books. Her newest book is Shadow King. It is, as I said, available now. You can find it on Amazon or at your local bookstore. They can order it. All of those good places that you go to for books. It's available in ebook, etc. So definitely check that out. The holidays are coming. If you know someone who likes fantasy, then this might be something that you want to get for them. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Um, I love my listeners and I love that you take this journey with me as part of that love. I, I get to do giveaways and give you books that we talk about on the podcast. This is another of those books. So I have copies of Shadow King to give away. All you have to do to enter those giveaways is uh, go to our social media pages Click on the episode, um, episode 124, interview with Susan K. Hamilton, and just comment on the post on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and you will automatically be entered into um, a drawing to win that, or a copy of Shadow King. So, as I said, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Click on episode 124, interview with Susan K. Hamilton, and comment on it, and you will be automatically entered to win a copy of Shadow King. So... You should definitely do that. And, you know, while you're there, like our page and leave us comments and do all those good things. I would I love to hear from you. So I always appreciate feedback and uh, love listening, l- love hearing from my listeners. Thank you again to Susan. Thank you to you for joining me. And I hope that you will join me again on Tuesday when I have another returning author. I'm excited that Priscilla Oliveras is returning to talk about the third book in her uh, Match to Perfection series about the Oliveras, excuse me, that's the author's last name, the Fernandez sisters. So we have had the first two sisters and now we are going to be talking about the third sister, Lily, and I'm excited to have because she's always such fun to chat with and looking forward to talking to her about this book and what she's got planned next. So join me for that on Tuesday, as I said. And in the meantime, have a wonderful weekend. If you have uh, an extra long weekend, that's perfect. You get more time for reading. So take some time and go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.